yeah. It's double. Double again. Hey, thanks for reaching out to me. Hey, sorry, uh, still in my work clothes here. Oh, must be busy working hard for that uh, that big day coming up. Wink, wink. Your secret safe with me. Oh, no, I'm just a mall Santa. Sure you are. Well, I won't tell anyone. You know, client confidentiality and all. Yeah, well, uh, anyway, I had some questions I wanted to ask you. Yeah, you wanted to uh, ask me about some uh, raw food, staying raw in the winter. Okay, uh, my first question has to do with the, the cold temperature. How, how am I going to deal with that? So, I know you live in, the, in Canada and it's cold there, and you live in an uh, uh, igloo. So, if you could tell me um, about uh, how you deal with the cold, you know, that would be really helpful. Yeah, good question. It's a common question. It's winter. It's cold. What do I do? I'm gonna freeze! Well, good news for you. That's not gonna happen. So there's a couple, uh, you know, really good strategies here. And so, uh, number one, we've got layers. Warm clothing. Lots of it. As much as you feel you need, wear it. And so that's gonna keep you warm. That's, what, what that's going to do is trap the heat in. Next, what we want to do is get your engine uh, working and creating more heat. So we're creating heat and we're trapping it in. So a uh, couple ways to do that. The easiest is exercise. Running, push-ups, jumping jacks, you know, moving is going to keep, uh, keep you warm. And it's not going to keep you warm for a super long time, but that is going to kind of keep you warm for maybe a half hour. If you have, when you finish your workout, probably a half hour or an hour after, you know, you're still warm. But then finally your body gets back to its sort of steady state and then maybe drops a little bit lower because, you know, maybe it's a little bit chilly in the house. So, uh, you know, keep the house warm, blankets, that kind of stuff. If, uh, if you can... Uh, you know, afford the heating bill. It, it takes it takes a lot to heat a house. But exercise, what that is going to do is increase what's called your thermic effect of food. And so, uh, basically, when you exercise regularly, you are going to have a higher total daily uh, energy expenditure. So you're just going to be burning more calories. And calories is basically heat. What one calorie is, is the amount of food that it takes to raise one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. And when, when uh, people, or scientists are... Uh, determining how many calories does said workout or activity burn, what they're doing is they're measuring, measuring the heat that you give off. And I'm not going to get into all the crazy science here, but they're measuring how much uh, a room heats up. You know, if they start with this room is at this temperature and they can measure it's exactly this temperature, do -do 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 -do, with all the crazy calculations, they figure out you burn that many calories. And so, by burning more calories, we will be generating heat. Heat, heat, heat gives off. And so, um, if you're sedentary, it's gonna be about 0%. If you're a crazy athletic person, it could be as much as 50% of your total energy expenditure. And uh, most people would be about 15 to 30%. So get up to that 30% area, you know. Stay active, that'll keep you warm. So what do we got? Layers, you know, keep the house warm, exercise. Uh, the next sort of scientific thing here we're talking about is the thermic effect of food, or you might have heard as it as the uh, as dietary thermogenesis. What the heck is that? 
Well, basically, when you eat food, your RMR, resting metabolic rate, increases, which means, like I said before, with the uh, heat being given off, you're gonna be generating a little bit more heat. I don't have the numbers for how much heat, uh, you know, that's out of my scope of scientific stuff. But, you're gonna be giving off more heat. Carbohydrate and protein will give you a greater uh, thermogenic effect of food than fat will. So, eat those uh, fruits and veggies, high carbs. And lastly, you know, a nice warm shower is gonna increase your core body temperature. And that'll take a while to, uh, you know, decrease. So, take a nice warm shower, put uh, some warm clothing on, and you're gonna be warm for the rest of the night. So, those are some ways to stay warm. Food, exercise, hold on, can we get some alliteration here? Food, fitness, fluffy blankets, and uh, what was the other thing I said? Layers, all right. FFFL. Anyway, so that's how you can stay warm and uh, make those winters nice and toasty. Hope that gave you your answers. So, uh, am I going to be missing warm food and cook food? Uh, wh what am I going to do about that? I, uh, I know you make some really awesome recipes and, and uh, maybe you have some good tips in the kitchen. Good question, common question. Am I going to miss the warm food, cook food and all that stuff? Well, there's a couple ways we can warm it up. There's some ways that everyone's gonna be able to do, and there's some stuff that, uh, you know, you're gonna need a dehydrator for, but we'll go from the easy to the uh, uh, more involved, or uh, not so much involved, but requiring a certain appliance. So, uh, the bo most basic, basic is uh, taking uh, the foods that you're going to be eating out of the fridge and just let them warm up to room temperature. Now maybe your house isn't super warm and, and room temperature isn't all that warm. So what you could do is soak them in some warm water, whether it's in the sink or a bowl. That's okay. Um, sometimes you want to warm something up that you, you can't really soak in warm water. Maybe you want to warm up leftovers from the, uh, the day before and let's say you made zucchini pasta. You can't really soak that in warm water. It's just, you're just gonna wash the sauce off the noodles. So I have what I call a double boiler. And take two bowls, metal ones work best because the metal's gonna conduct better uh, temperature. So let's take our small bowl, fill that with the food you wanna warm up. Take this, fill it with the nice hot tap water. Put it in there put a, a towel over top, and over the next one, two, three, four hours, change the water a couple times, and the food's gonna warm up, you know, stir the food, and you're gonna have like a warm meal. Now this is, uh, the next thing, something I personally don't do, uh, is uh, using the stove top, and you can like, at a really low temperature, uh, warm up a soup or something like that, or, or whatever, food you want to warm up. Uh, you can also drink warm water, boiled water, warm lemon water, something like that. If you're blending up a, a soup or something, salad dressing, you can let it warm up a bit in the blender. Uh, with a dehydrator, you can just put the food in the dehydrator, warm it up. With uh, dehydrator, you could also warm your salad up if you, if you thought you're your salad was too cold to eat. So we can warm up our food in, in a lot of different ways. And uh, another nice tip here is to warm your plate. Get like, if you got like nice thick ceramic plates, you can warm those up and uh, basically put the food on that and that'll keep that, that warm food warm longer. And um, lastly, what we can add to the food, if you if you so desire, are some warming spices, you know, chili, pepper, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, ginger, cinnamon, to any varying degree, you know, if that's what you want to eat, you can definitely include that in the, uh, in the winters. And uh, yeah, you know, you can get really creative with the food. I don't think you're gonna miss cooked food at all, especially if uh, 
you make uh, some of the recipes out of my book. Shameless plug! Hope that answered your questions. Peace. So, um, you know, for some people, winter is not the their favorite time of year, and uh, so what, what can people do about that, and uh, you know, to get through the winter being raw? Hey, uh, yeah, I get that a lot, you know, oh, winter sucks, I hate it, blah, blah, blah. Um, you gotta get out of that mindset. Get rid of it, because, you know, don't make it more difficult. Don't focus on the bad stuff, like, oh, I don't like it, it's cold, blah, 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 blah. Find a passion. Find a passion. I'm a cyclist, so that was really easy for me to keep on cycling in the winter. Get the warm gear, get the snow tires, get lights and reflectors, and there I am biking in the winter, exercising, staying warm, and, uh, you know, loving it. So. Yeah, I love riding this in the summer, but every now and then, yeah, you know, I kind of like riding in the winter. Riding, no wind, maybe the snow's just kind of like whoosh, whoosh, just coming down in flakes, it's just slow motion, and I'm riding along, and the snow is crunching under my tires, and you can smell a, a fireplace burning, and and that's kind of nice. Then sometimes it's hailing and uh, you know it's freezing cold and I can't feel my fingers. But most of the time, uh, you know, winter sports, you know, they're fun. So try skiing, whether it's downhill or cross country, snowshoeing. Um, you can still run in the winter, or you could do hot yoga. Hot yoga in the winter, hello. So uh, definitely find a winter passion. Uh, something that you enjoy about winter, making snowmen, going tobogganing, uh, or snow woman, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so lots of cool things to do, you know, get together with your, your little ones in the family, go sh snow, tobog go tobogganing or do, do something like that. Have fun, snowball fights, make forts, whatever. So find a passion. So passions are important, find a reason to love the winter. Or go on a vacation every now and then. Hope that helped. Make friends with the winter. Don't dread it. Take it day by day. And, uh, <laughs> what can you say? Make the best of what you got and be happy that, uh, you know, at least you have a house to, to stay warm in. Alright, so stay happy. Think of the positives, get a hobby. Peace, hope that answered your question. All right, so in the past, you know, I've uh, bought fruit during the winter and, and sometimes it doesn't ripen up very well. And uh, I know I'm gonna be eating a lot of ripe fruit and, and uh, you know, how, how do I keep ripe fruit around all the time so that I, uh, I don't uh, run out of food? Yeah, fruit ripening in the winter. I see that all the time. It's like I spend every waking second of my time answering questions on forums. Ah, fruit ripening, blah, blah, blah. So, I'll give you every tip that I know on making fruit ripen well. All right, well, fruit that's ripening up probably is from the tropics. And the tropics are warm. Fruit wants to be in the warm spot. Find the warmest place of your house or apartment or wherever you're living. This could be in, in the furnace room or it could be maybe even a room that gets sunlight in it. Certain rooms are just going to be warmer. Uh, and if there's really not a warm room, what you could do is try and set up a fruit ripening room or even uh, like in some sort of enclosure. You could get a space heater, put a timer on it, and, and turn the heater on every, um, every couple hours or something for, for a little bit. And uh, 
depending on the size of the room and how strong the heater is, blah, blah, blah. You're gonna have to figure that all out on your own, but uh, I've seen people have fruit shelves and they kind of enclose it in plastic and then have a heater every now and then, or you don't even need a heater if it's in the sunlight, but you gotta insulate something to, to hold the heat and keep the fruit warm, but they like the warm temperatures. Other ways, you know, if you're dehydrating something, you can put your bananas on top of the dehydrator and that'll help warm it up. Put a blanket on top uh, of the bananas on top of the dehydrator or just in general, put a blanket on top so they, they stay a bit warmer. Uh, next thing you can do is put bananas in the oven and turn the light on and the light will, uh, you know, generate some heat. And so that, that's another way you can uh, keep them warm. But, gotta keep them warm some way, uh, somehow. Also, trapping them in something traps the ethylene gas and makes them ripen up faster. Uh, sometimes it's out of your hand and you just don't have the control because maybe your bananas have been exposed to colder temperatures in transit and, and it happens. Um, but. Hopefully, hopefully they don't, but sometimes bananas, if they kind of look a bit brownish, they've, they've, been, they've gotten cold, but they'll still ripen up all right. So, hope that helps. Okay, so, you know, around this time of year, there's a lot of gatherings and get-togethers, friends and family, parties and so on, and uh, I'm not really sure, uh, you know, how to deal with that and what do I bring and and uh, are they gonna understand uh, you know what I'm doing and uh, if you could just give me some tips about that that would be really helpful yeah Christmas parties got a couple coming up myself and so you know how can we how can we get through them <laughs> there's a lot that can be said on social outings and, and all of this stuff Surround yourself first and foremost with, with understanding people. Your friends and your family, they should be understanding. Hopefully, you know, cross our fingers. They're not always, uh, but if, if they're not understanding right away, that's the next step. We talk to them in, in a, uh, you know, a, a nice open way and, uh, you know, say it's just really important to you that this is the way you eat and um, during that conversation you're happy to answer whatever question you want and maybe at parties you'll be happy to answer questions but maybe you express to them that you know at parties I'm not really interested in talking about my diet that's up to you to decide if um, you find that at parties everyone's just like Rah! Why do you eat this? Protein, protein, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can say, hey, at parties, you know, let's just enjoy ourselves, our company, and, you know, you can go about it that way. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the personal level. Next, uh, maybe, maybe you feel left out. You know, everyone else is doing uh, things or eating things that maybe you used to eat. Maybe they're drinking, so what you could do is make a fruit juice and I mean it could look any color, it could be fancy and you could be drinking out of a, a fancy glass just like they are and uh, you know, no one's questioning you saying, hey how come you're not drinking? And uh, so that's, that's another way. You can eat before so there's no temptations or uh, you can make some sort of nice fancy fancy food for you to eat and, and other people might want to try it as well. It's all about creating uh, a welcoming and accepting environment and being accepting is really important. You have to accept them, especially if you're their guest, you have to accept those people of what they're doing, it's their choice, and then hopefully they're going to accept you, right? It's a two-way street. So, uh, hope that helps. Those are some of my tips on, uh, you know, Christmas parties or any party, really. Okay, so, you know, I've been on different diets before and, and uh, you know, things like that. And uh, a lot of times 
we start for a little while and then I find myself reaching for a, a cookie or a, a candy cane and uh, I was just wondering, uh, you know, how can I really stick with this raw thing? Because, you know, I think it's a, a, a really healthy thing to, to try. Yeah, sticking to diets. People, they just fall off the wagon left, right and center. So how do we, how do we stick with it? You know, this is something that I, I could talk a great deal on. We're gonna condense it. And so uh, there's motivation and we have extrinsic motivation and intrinsic. Intrinsic is like infinitely more powerful in terms of, of keeping you to, to doing something. I'll give you an example of extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic is like doing something for money or in case of a diet, doing it because you want to lose weight. That's that external goal. I'm doing this because I want that, which is weight loss. And, and there's multiple types of, of, of external motivation or extrinsic, external, same thing. Um, there's one called introjected motivation is where you're, you're doing something out of guilt. Let's say you are, um, you're really struggling and you're, you're craving cooked food or whatever it is and you stay raw or, or do whatever. This motivation applies to any situation. You're staying raw out of guilt. It's that introjected motivation that other people are putting on you. They're saying, uh, like we all your friends on Facebook, it's like, oh, I gotta be raw to live up to their standards. And so that's another type of motivation. And it's, it motivates you, but what we need is intrinsic motivation. And that might not come right away. It'll come eventually. And you have to do it because you love it. You love the food. You love how it is so easy to digest, it's tasty, it's easy to make, easy to clean. You just love every aspect of it. That's what you primarily need to develop. It takes time. So intrinsic motivation is going to uh, keep, keep, keep you on the right track. That's what you need. You, you can only have so much willpower, that stuff's gonna run out. It's like a, like a tank of gas. You can't, you can't keep filling it up because it's a, it's a non-renewable resource. Intrinsic motivation, it's like solar power. <laughs> yeah. So uh, support groups are really good, whether that's a, a local vegan, raw vegan kind of community or most likely an online community. So get connected with people. Another way uh, for motivation is to have, have a vision board. So if you create uh, like a collage of all these different pictures, it could be uh, whatever, written words and this and that, printed off or snipped out of magazines that are something that's going to inspire you. That's a, that's a good thing to do as well. And another thing uh, that helps me stick to the diet, especially in the winter, is when... Uh, you're, you're, you're anticipating the winter fruits coming to seed, and it's like, yes, I can't wait, I can't wait. Got persimmons, pomegranates, and citrus is awesome in the winter. So even if your bananas aren't ripening up super well, you still got citrus and persim, or sorry, pomegranates, and uh, keep a ton of persimmons around, so they're always, uh, you always got to ripe persimmons as well. And uh, yeah, you know, intrinsic motivation is key, 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 key. So definitely uh, use those tips and uh, I, hope, I hope that helps answer the question. Uh, I can't give you intrinsic motivation. I can help you with, uh, you know, guiding you, but you have to, Find that reason. Why do you love this lifestyle and stick to it like that? And, and when you love it, you're not going to do anything but it. And so that's going to keep you on track in the winter. 
Anyway, I hope that answers the question. Hope, hope that helps you, uh, you know, get ready for winter. And so you can uh, be prepared and tackle winter and, uh, you know, stay raw. Feel awesome. So, uh, as I'm getting older and I'm researching about diet and, and living healthfully, uh, finding more and more about um, vitamins and minerals and stuff, and, and uh, vitamin D in the winter is, uh, is really difficult to get. So, as, uh, as a raw vegan, you know, how, how am I going to get vitamin D and, and where does it come from? Yeah, I knew that one was coming. Vitamin D in the winter, that's a hot topic. <laughs> I wish the winter was as hot as the topic. Um, I'm not gonna cover every single thing about vitamin D. That could take uh, a really long time. So, vitamin D is produced in the body, the, the UV B rays hit our skin and we make it. it the uh, active form in the body is called calcitrol. And as the name suggests, it has something to do with calcium. It helps absorb calcium. And that's important because calcium, uh, the most abundant uh, mineral in the body, makes up uh, 2% of our weight in the, in the bones. Uh, is calcium and if we're not absorbing calcium we can get uh, weaker bones rickets is bone deformation it can also uh, low vitamin D and thus low calcium uh, cause weak muscles because calcium is used in muscle contractions boom <laughs> but uh, and and uh, also uh, Vitamin D is shown to prevent cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, things like that. It's important. So how do we get it? Well, first of all, it's a fat-soluble vitamin, and so we can store it in our fat. And everyone has fat. Even if you're uh, a string bean, you're super skinny, you got, you've got a fair amount of fat on you. and um, gets stored in the fat and then it gets released as it's needed and uh, so first tip is during the summer make sure you get lots of uh, outside time and store it obviously not everyone can live at the equator uh, I would love to but right now I'm in Canadiana in my igloo uh, but store as much as you can Number two is uh, UV, as I call it. And so we can either get UV from uh, hopping on a plane and going somewhere where the sun is shining, or if flying on a plane to uh, the tropics is just not gonna work, well maybe we can uh, use technology and kind of create our own sun with a vitamin D lamp. More on that in a moment, but let's take a step back and just talk about the different uh, types of light in the spectrum. The sun is going to emit what's called the full spectrum. That's the uh, infrared, which has three separate categories. We don't really need to worry about infrared. Then there's the visual light that we can see. And then there's the ultraviolet, which again, similar to the uh, infrared, has three distinctions. You've likely heard of uh, UVA and UVB. There's also UVC. We don't really need to worry about it in this case. UVA, UVC emitted by the sun. UVA passes through the ozone uh, without any sort of uh, issue in 95% of the uh, ultraviolet light is uh, UVA and 5% is UVB with uh, the remaining very small amount being UVC, ultraviolet C. So what are the difference between UVA and UVB? First of all, UVB is the, the good light or the, it's not, 
uh, the, the good ultraviolet light. It, uh, I don't want to really say good and bad, they're, they're both beneficial, but too much is a bad thing for both of them. Too much UVB, it's going to cause skin damage, uh, DNA damage, it's going to cause damage, and uh, too much UVA causes wrinkling and aging, but what, which, which, which light <laughs> produces uh, vitamin D or synthesizes vitamin D? It is UVB. We want UVB. And UVB hits our skin, and in our skin is a, a cholesterol derivative called 7-dehydrocholesterol. And when the vitamin, or sorry, when the UVB hits the skin, uh, that goes through a reaction, and then it goes through several other reactions in the liver and the kidney, and we get vitamin D called uh, calcitrol. Anyway, we don't need to worry about all the, the ins and outs of that. I just want to give you a little bit of uh, background information on how is it made, which, which light does which. Uh, it should be noted that both ultraviolet rays cleanse the blood, cleanse the lymph. Those are uh, important parts of the light. But as always, too much can be a bad thing. So, we can use these lamps to, uh, to sun ourselves. Now, they're pretty expensive, but I've done some research on them, and you know, you can buy the really expensive $2,000 stuff that's full body that you'll stand in front of, or you can buy smaller ones. Now, you're thinking, hey, maybe I can go to uh, a, a tanning salon and use the, the tanning beds. Well, tanning beds are mostly UVA. There is some UVB, but by law, it is uh, reduced to 3%. And what I also want to uh, mention about percentage of UVB, um, you might see a lamp that says 6% UVB and another one says 10% and you think, well the 10% has got to be better. But if the 10% the light is emitting 50, let's just call 50 whatevers, just as an example, well 10% of 50 compared to 6% of, say, you know, 100, well now, the 6% one is doing more. So, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about some options here. Well, if they're really expensive, what else can we do? Reptile lights are basically the same thing, because reptiles, they need the sun as well for vitamin D. And so, if we can get uh, some reptile lights and um, just kind of make our own sunning system, it might be cheaper. Now, I will post a link below which documents someone's one year, two year even, experiment using uh, vitamin D lamps, uh, reptile lamps, just as a reading light, you know, just screwing it into a a bulb and just reading with a shirt off for you know however long every couple days or something just using that as experiment so I'll post that it's an interesting read uh, in the end he concludes that maybe uh, you need something that's more powerful to get a to get a good effect but it definitely does work um, I'll post two or three websites where you can buy uh, vitamin D lamps. Only one is uh, USDA certified and they have, all of them have a wealth of information and studies and that kind of stuff that you can read as well. So, like I said, this is a hot topic. There's a lot of research I've done into it and you're going to have to do your own research to, to decide, hmm, do I want to buy um, a reptile light, do you want to buy the expensive uh, type of light. Now what I also wanted to mention uh, is that 
UVA rays also uh, they will break down the vitamin D that you uh, create with uh, the UVB rays so so the tanning beds were uh, basically mostly UVA rays and um, tanning beds might not be the best solution for vitamin D that's just something I wanted to uh, kind of fit in there that I forgot to mention on the bulb the, the vitamin D bulb subject but there is a third option and that's supplementation and the first thing I, I recommend before supplementing is getting uh, a test and I'll post a link below where you can, you can like order this test you prick your finger and blood and set, send, send them the blood and they'll they'll test you for your vitamin D so I think that's about $75 maybe you have a, a local uh, test that you can do but what test do you want 25 hydroxy vitamin D test now like like a lot of things there's a lot of conflicting information. This person says you should test at this range. This person says you should test at that range. So, uh, Don Bennett, who has done a lot of research, he says that uh, between 50 and 80 uh, nanograms per milliliter is a good place to test. But some people say if you're testing as low as 10 nanograms per milliliter, no problem. Other people, they're in the 40 to 50, 60 to 70 range. They're all over the place. No one can agree. But if, if 10 nano units is the bare minimum that just lets you get by, that's, that's really not enough. Because um, the definition of a vitamin is something that is required to avoid a deficiency or deficiency symptom and I, I already discussed what the deficiency symptoms of vitamin D are so in the past it was believed that as long as you're avoiding the deficiency symptoms you're good what we're learning now is that here's where you're deficient if you're here you're good if you're here you're great right same for vitamin C and all these other things rather than just avoiding scurvy if you have more it's it's better now of course remember vitamin D is fat soluble and it can be toxic but you need to be supplementing a crazy amount to, to uh, achieve toxic levels so don't worry about the toxicity too much now how much should you supplement if you are going to supplement again all this conflicting information some people say you should take oh 400 to 600 I use international units a day other recommendations are 1000 I use per 25 pounds of body weight so about 5000 for uh, an adult or slightly more slightly less you say, whoa, that, that's a big big difference compared to what other people are saying. Well, if you spend some time in the sun, you know, a day at the beach, you're going to generate between 10,000 to 40,000 IUs. So, it's all, all relative. Remember, vitamin D is good. It's, it's difficult to get to, to toxic levels naturally. You're just not going to get it from the sun. You'll get burnt and go inside before you get toxic levels. So, with supplementation, there's two types of uh, vitamin D you could supplement. There's D3 and D2. D2 is created in mushrooms when uh, the UVB rays kind of synthesize it and it's much less potent and so it's not nearly as good as vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is what we create when the sun's rays, the UVB rays, hit our skin and we synthesize it. So how do they make it with a supplement? Well, they take that pre-vitamin D uh, cholesterol derivative, not from us, but from sheep's wool, and it's also in, in milk of different species. So they take that, they emit it to UVB rays with bulbs that are uh, what I mentioned that you could 
use on yourself, then they bottle those, uh, the vitamin D and, and sell it. So, do you want to take a supplement that is not vegan? This is your choice. Do a lot of research. I am considering uh, experimenting with the, uh, the bulbs and seeing how that goes. I'm going to get my vitamin D tested because I've done four years of uh, no supplement at all. And uh, at the end of the winter, you know, you're feeling like, oh, I just want this winter to end. That seasonal affective disorder, SAD, not standard American diet. But am I getting rickets and bone weakness? I'm not, I'm not getting that kind of deficiency because I, I do spend a lot of time in the summer and I, I store it. So, vitamin D, it's a big, big... Sorry, the battery ran out, but... As you can see, vitamin D is a, it's a big topic, lots of things to consider, but in the summer, if you build up that store, that's a, that's a good start, then you, uh, you have you know, your, your vacations, as well as your uh, D2 that maybe you get from mushrooms, and, and uh, you can even supplement D2, although remember it's not as effective. And then to get D3, you can either use a lamp or there is always the, uh, the, the option of supplementing. Uh, personally, taking a, a non-vegan supplement is not something I would do, but it's very important to uh, understand the options as vitamin D deficiency is uh, something that you don't want to have happen. Remember, deficiency symptoms could be uh, weak bones and osteoporosis, that kind of stuff. So you don't want to be um, going down that road. So get lots of sun when it's available and synthesize it however you can uh, when it's not. Hope that helped. Hope you enjoyed the video. Peace. Oh yeah, it's Double Organic. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Comment, like, share, and subscribe. We've got epic recipes for you. Fitness and raw food motivation. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram. You won't regret it. Stay tuned for more.